The July, which immediately succeeded my marriage, was made memorable by three cases of interest in which I had the privilege of being associated with Sherlock Holmes and of studying his methods. No case, however, in which Holmes was ever engaged has illustrated the value of his analytical method so clearly, or has impressed those who were associated with him so deeply. I still retain an almost verbatim report of the interview in which he demonstrated the true facts of the case to Monsieur Dubuc of the Paris police and Fritz von Waldbaum, the well-known specialist of Danzig, both of whom had wasted their energies upon what proved to be side issues. During my school days, I had been intimately associated with a lad named Percy Phelps, who was of much the same age as myself, though he was two classes ahead of me. This gaudy relationship did him little good at school. I heard vaguely that his abilities and the influence which he commanded had won him a good position at the Foreign Office, and then he passed completely out of my mind until the following letter recalled his existence. Briar Bray, Woking it is possible even that you may have heard that, through my uncle's influence, I obtained a good appointment at the Foreign Office, and that I was in a situation of trust and honour until a horrible misfortune came suddenly to blast my career. Do you think that you could bring your friend, Mr. Holmes, down to see me? I should like to have his opinion of the case, though the authorities assure me that nothing more can be done— Every minute seems an hour while I live in this horrible suspense. I'm still so weak that I have to write, as you see, by dictating. There was something that touched me as I read this letter, something pitiable in the reiterated appeals to bring Holmes. So moved was I that, even if it had been a difficult matter, I should have tried it. But of course I knew well that Holmes loved his art so, that he was ever as ready to bring his aid as his client could be to receive it. My wife agreed with me that not a moment should be lost in laying the matter before him. And so, within an hour of breakfast time, I found myself back once more in the old rooms in Baker Street. Holmes was seated at his side table, clad in his dressing gown, and working hard over a chemical investigation. My friend hardly glanced up as I entered, and I, seeing that his investigation must be of importance, seated myself in an armchair and waited. If this paper remains blue, all is well. If it turns red, it means a man's life. He dipped it into the test tube, and it flushed at once into a dull, dirty crimson. I will be at your service in one instant, Watson. You will find tobacco in the Persian slipper. He turned to his desk and scribbled off several telegrams, which were handed over to the page boy. A very commonplace little murder, said he. You've got something better, I fancy. You are the stormy petrol of crime, Watson. What is it? I handed him the letter, which he read with the most concentrated attention. It does not tell us very much, does it? he remarked, as he handed it back to me. Hardly anything, and yet the writing is of interest. But the writing is not his own. Precisely, it is a woman's. A man's, surely, I cried. No, a woman's, and a woman of rare character. You see, at the commencement of an investigation— it is something to know that your client is in close contact with someone who, for good or evil, has an exceptional nature. My interest is already awakened in the case. If you are ready, we will start at once for Woking, and see this diplomatist who is in such evil case, and the lady to whom he dictates his letters. We were fortunate enough to catch an early train at Waterloo, and in a little under an hour we found ourselves among the firwoods and the heather of Woking.
Briar Bray proved to be a large, detached house, standing in extensive grounds within a few minutes' walk of the station. On sending in our cards, we were shown into an elegantly appointed drawing-room, where we were joined in a few minutes by a rather stout man, who received us with much hospitality. His age may have been nearer forty than thirty. Ah, poor old chap, he clings to any straw. His father and mother asked me to see you, for the mere mention of the subject is very painful to them. We have had no details yet, observed Holmes. For a moment I thought you had done something clever. Joseph Harrison is my name, and as Percy is to marry my sister Annie, I shall at least be a relation by marriage. You will find my sister in his room, for she has nursed him hand and foot these two months back. Perhaps we had better go in at once, for I know how impatient he is. The chamber into which we were shown was on the same floor as the drawing-room. A young man, very pale and worn, was lying upon a sofa near the open window, through which came the rich scent of the garden and the balmy summer air. A woman was sitting beside him, and rose as we entered. "'How are you, Watson?' said he cordially. "'I should never have known you under that moustache, and I dare say you would not be prepared to swear to me. This, I presume, is your celebrated friend, Mr. Sherlock Holmes.' I introduced him in a few words, and we both sat down. The stout young man had left us, but his sister still remained, with her hand in that of the invalid. I'll plunge into the matter without further preamble. I was a happy and successful man, Mr. Holmes, and on the eve of being married when a sudden and dreadful misfortune wrecked all my prospects in life. I was, as Watson may have told you, in the Foreign Office, and through the influence of my uncle, Lord Holdhurst, I rose rapidly to a responsible position. You have a desk in your office? Yes, sir. When you are finished, relock both the original and the draft in the desk. And hand them over to me personally tomorrow morning. I took the papers and— Excuse me an instant, said Holmes. I glanced my eyes over it, and then settled down to my task of copying— it is of the utmost importance that you should notice this point. I went down the stairs and into the hall, where I found the commissionaire fast asleep in his box, with the kettle boiling furiously upon the spirit lamp, for the water was spurting over the floor. I had put out my hand and was about to shake the man, who was still sleeping soundly, when a bell over his head rang loudly, and he woke with a start. "'Mr. Phelps, sir,' said he, looking at me in bewilderment. "'I came down to see if my coffee was ready. "'I was boiling the kettle when I fell asleep, sir.' "'He looked at me and then up at the still quivering bell, "'with an ever-growing astonishment upon his face. "'If you was here, sir, then who rang the bell?' he asked. "'The bell?' I said. "'What bell is it? "'It's the bell of the room you were working in.' Someone, then, was in that room where my precious treaty lay upon the table. I recognised in an instant that the thief must have come up the stairs from the side door. Of course, I must have met him if he had come the other way. You were satisfied that he could not have been concealed in the room all the time, or in the corridor which you have just described as dimly lighted. It is absolutely impossible. A rat could not conceal himself either in the room or the corridor. The commissionaire, seeing by my pale face that something was to be feared, had followed me upstairs. Now we both rushed along the corridor and down the steep steps which led to Charles Street. Has anyone passed this way? I've been standing here for a quarter of an hour, sir, said he. Only one person has passed during that time, a woman, tall and elderly, with a paisley shawl. Ah, oh, that is only my wife, cried the commissionaire. Has no one else passed? No one. 
Then it must be the other way that the thief took, cried the fellow, tugging at my sleeve. Which way did the woman go? I cried. You're only wasting your time, sir. And every minute now is of importance, cried the commissionaire. Take my word for it that my old woman has nothing to do with it, and come down to the other end of the street. But don't let yourself be drawn away upon a false scent, Mr. Phelps. Come to the other end of the street, and let us see if we can hear of anything. Nothing was to be lost by following his advice. With the policeman we both hurried down, but only to find the street full of traffic, many people coming and going, but all only too eager to get to a place of safety upon so wet a night. There was no lounger who could tell us who had passed. Then we returned to the office and searched the stairs and the passage without result. The corridor which led to the room was laid down with a kind of creamy linoleum which shows an impression very easily. We examined it very carefully, but found no outline of any footmark. How is it, then, that the woman who came into the room about nine left no traces with her muddy boots? I'm glad you raised the point. The charwomen are in the habit of taking off their boots at the commissioner's office and putting on list slippers. What did you do next? We examined the room also. The carpet prevents any possibility of a trapdoor, and the ceiling is of the ordinary whitewashed kind. I will pledge my life that whoever stole my papers could only have come through the door. Whoever rang it must have come right up to the desk to do it. But why should any criminal wish to ring the bell? It is a most insoluble mystery. What were your next steps? You examined the room, I presume, to see if the intruder had left any traces, any cigar end or dropped glove or hairpin or other trifle. There was nothing of the sort. I never smoked myself, so I think I should have observed it if there had been any smell of tobacco. The only tangible fact was that the commissionaire's wife, Mrs. Tangy was the name, had hurried out of the place. He could give no explanation, save that it was about the time when the woman always went home. The policeman and I agreed that our best plan would be to seize the woman before she could get rid of the papers, presuming that she had them. The alarm had reached Scotland Yard by this time, and Mr. Forbes, the detective, came round at once and took up the case with a great deal of energy. Her mother had not come back yet, and we were shown into the front room to wait. About ten minutes later a knock came at the door, and here we made the one serious mistake for which I blame myself. Instead of opening the door ourselves, we allowed the girl to do so. We heard her say, "'Mother, there are two men in the house waiting to see you,' and an instant afterwards we heard the patter of feet rushing down the passage. Forbes flung open the door, and we both ran into the back room or kitchen. But the woman had got there before us. She stared at us with defiant eyes, and then suddenly recognising me. An expression of absolute astonishment came over her face. "'Why, if it isn't Mr. Phelps of the office!' she cried. "'Come, come, who do you think we were when you ran away from us?' asked my companion. You must come back with us to Scotland Yard to be searched. A four-wheeler was brought, and we all three drove back in it. We had first made an examination of the kitchen, and especially of the kitchen fire, to see whether she might have made away with the papers during the instant that she was alone. I waited in an agony of suspense until she came back with her report. Dr. Ferrier had just heard enough from the detective at the station to be able to give an idea of what had happened, and his story did not mend matters. The commissioner and his wife have been examined in every way without any light being thrown upon the matter. The suspicions of the police then rested upon young Gorrow, who, as you may remember, stayed overtime in the office that night. His remaining behind and his French name 
were really the only two points which could suggest suspicion. But as a matter of fact, I did not begin work until he had gone. And his people are of Huguenot extraction, but as English in sympathy and tradition as you and I are. Nothing was found to implicate him in any way, and there the matter dropped. I turn to you, Mr. Holmes, as absolutely my last hope. The invalid sank back upon his cushions, tired out by this long recital, while his nurse poured him out a glass of some stimulating medicine. Holmes sat silently with his head thrown back and his eyes closed in an attitude which might seem listless to a stranger, but which I knew betokened the most intense absorption. "'Your statement has been so explicit,' said he at last, that you have really left me very few questions to ask. There is one of the very utmost importance, however. Did you tell anyone that you had this special task to perform? No one. Not Miss Harrison here, for example? No. I had not been back to Woking between getting the order and executing the commission. And none of your people had by chance been to see you? None. Did any of them know their way about in the office? Oh, yes, all of them had been shown over it. Still, of course, if you said nothing to anyone about the treaty, these inquiries are irrelevant. What a lovely thing a rose is! He walked past the couch to the open window, and held up the drooping stalk of a moss rose, looking down at the dainty blend of crimson and green. It was a new phase of his character to me, for I had never before seen him show any keen interest in natural objects. There is nothing in which deduction is so necessary as in religion, said he, leaning with his back against the shutters. Percy Phelps and his nurse looked at Holmes during this demonstration with surprise, and a good deal of disappointment written upon their faces. It had lasted some minutes before the young lady broke in upon it. "'Do you see any prospect of solving this mystery, Mr. Holmes?' she asked, with a touch of asperity in her voice. "'Oh, the mystery!' he answered, coming back with a start to the realities of life. "'Well, it would be absurd to deny that the case is a very abstruse and complicated one. But I can promise you that I will look into the matter and let you know any points which may strike me. Do you see any clue? You have furnished me with seven, but of course I must test them before I can pronounce upon their value. What? Of coming to conclusions too rapidly. Your advice is very excellent, Miss Harrison said Holmes, rising. Well, I'll come out by the same train tomorrow, though it's more than likely that my report will be a negative one. God bless you for promising to come, cried our client. Come, Watson, for we have a good day's work before us in town. Mr. Joseph Harrison drove us down to the station, and we were soon whirling up in a Portsmouth train. Holmes was sunk in profound thought, and hardly opened his mouth until we had passed Clapham Junction. It's a very cheering thing to come into London by any of these lines which run high, and allow you to look down upon the houses like this. Lighthouses, my boy, beacons of the future, capsules with hundreds of bright little seeds in each, out of which will spring the wiser, better England of the future. The poor devil has certainly got himself into very deep water, and it's a question whether we shall ever be able to get him ashore. Oh, if you find your own cases more interesting than mine, said Holmes, with some asperity. I was going to say that my practice could get along very well for a day or two, since it is the slackest time in the year. Then we'll look into this matter together. You said you had a clue? Well, we have several, but we can only test their value by further inquiry. Who is it that profits by it? There is the French ambassador, there is the Russian, 
There is whoever might sell it to either of these. And there is Lord Holdhurst. Lord Holdhurst? Well, it is just conceivable that a statesman might find himself in a position where he was not sorry to have such a document accidentally destroyed. Not a statesman with the honourable record of Lord Holdhurst. It is a possibility, and we cannot afford to disregard it. We shall see the noble lord today, and find out if he can tell us anything. Why should the bell ring? Was it the thief that did it out of bravado? Or was it someone who was with the thief, who did it in order to prevent the crime? Or was it an accident, or was it... He sank back into the state of intense and silent thought from which he had emerged. But it seemed to me, accustomed as I was to his every mood, that some new possibility had dawned suddenly upon him. Holmes had already wired to Forbes, and we found him waiting to receive us. A small, foxy man, with a sharp but by no means amiable expression. "'I've heard of your methods before now, Mr. Holmes,' said he tartly. "'On the contrary,' said Holmes, "'out of my last fifty-three cases my name has only appeared in four, and the police have had all the credit in forty-nine. "'I'd be very glad of a hint or two, said the detective, changing his manner. Uh, "'Mrs. Tangy drinks, and our woman has been with her twice when she was well on, but she could get nothing out of her. What explanation did she give of having answered the bell when Mr. Phelps rang for the coffee? She said that her husband was very tired and she wished to relieve him. Well, certainly that would agree with his being found a little later asleep in his chair. Did you point out to her that you and Mr. Phelps, who started at least twenty minutes after her, got home before her? She explains that by the difference between a bus and a hansom. Did you ask her whether in leaving she met anyone, or saw anyone, loitering about Charles Street? She saw no one but the constable. Well, you seem to have cross-examined her pretty thoroughly. Anything else? Well, we have nothing else to go upon. No evidence of any kind. Have you formed any theory about how that bell rang? Well, I must confess that it beats me. We are now going to interview Lord Holthurst, the Cabinet Minister and future Premier of England. We were fortunate in finding that Lord Holthurst was still in his chambers at Downing Street. And on Holmes sending in his card, we were instantly shown up. Your name is very familiar to me, Mr. Holmes, said he, smiling. In whose interest are you acting, may I ask? "'In that of Mr. Percy Phelps,' answered Holmes. "'Ah, my unfortunate nephew. "'You can understand that our kinship makes it the more impossible for me to screen him in any way. "'I had one or two questions which I wished to ask you, Lord Holdhurst. "'Then you could hardly have been overheard. It is out of the question. "'Did you ever mention to anyone that it was your intention to give out the treaty to be copied? "'Never!' Well, since you never said so, and Mr. Phelps never said so, and nobody else knew anything of the matter, then the thief's presence in the room was purely accidental. You take me out of my province there, said he. Holmes considered for a moment. There is another very important point which I wish to discuss with you, said he. If the treaty had reached, let us say the French or Russian foreign office, "'You would expect to hear of it?' "'I should,' said Lord Holdhurst, with a wry face. "'We can hardly suppose, Mr. Holmes, that the thief took the treaty "'in order to frame it and hang it up.' "'That is most important,' said Holmes. "'I did not say so,' said Holmes imperturbably. "'And now, Lord Holdhurst, we have already taken up too much of your valuable time, "'and we shall wish you good day.' "'Every success to your investigation, be the criminal who it may,' answered the nobleman, as he bowed us out at the door. "'He's a fine fellow,' said Holmes, as we came out into Whitehall. 
You noticed, of course, that his boots had been resold. Now, Watson, I won't detain you from your legitimate work any longer. He had had no answer to his advertisement, he said, and no fresh light had been thrown upon the case. We found our client still under the charge of his devoted nurse, but looking considerably better than before. My report, as I expected, is a negative one, said Holmes. I have seen Forbes, and I have seen your uncle, and I have set one or two trains of inquiry upon foot which may lead to something. You have not lost heart, then? By no means. God bless you for saying that, cried Miss Harrison. If we keep our courage and our patience, the truth must come out. We have more to tell you than you have for us, said Phelps, reseating himself upon the couch. Do you know, said he, that I begin to believe that I am the unconscious centre of some monstrous conspiracy, and that my life is aimed at, as well as my honour. Ah! cried Holmes. This is most interesting, said Holmes. Pray, what did you do then? I should have followed him through the open window, if I had been stronger. Joseph and the groom found marks on the flower-bed outside the window but the weather has been so dry lately that they found it hopeless to follow the trail across the grass. This tale of our clients appeared to have an extraordinary effect upon Sherlock Holmes. Misfortunes never come singly, said Phelps, smiling, though it was evident that his adventure had somewhat shaken him. You have certainly had your share, said Holmes. I am afraid not, said Holmes, shaking his head. I think I must ask you to remain sitting exactly where you are. We passed round the lawn to the outside of the young diplomatist's window. There were, as he had said, marks upon the flower-bed, but they were hopelessly blurred and vague. Holmes stood over them for an instant and then rose, shrugging his shoulders. Holmes strode round the house with his hands in his pockets, and a negligent air which was unusual with him. Let us have a look at that. The plump young man led us to a spot where the top of one of the wooden rails had been cracked. Do you think that was done last night? It looks rather old, does it not? Well, possibly so. There are no marks of anyone jumping down upon the other side. Let us go back to the bedroom and talk the matter over. Percy Phelps was walking very slowly, leaning upon the arm of his future brother-in-law. Holmes walked swiftly across the lawn, and we were at the open window of the bedroom long before the others came up. Miss Harrison, said Holmes, speaking with the utmost intensity of manner, you must stay where you are all day. Let nothing prevent you from staying where you are all day. It certainly... If you wish it, Mr. Holmes, said the girl in astonishment. Come out into the sunshine. No, thank you, Joseph. What do you propose now, Mr. Holmes? asked our client. Then, if my friend of the night comes to revisit me, he will find the bird flown. We are all in your hands, Mr. Holmes, and you must tell us exactly what you would like done. Perhaps you would prefer that Joseph came with us, so as to look after me. Oh, no, my friend Watson is a medical man, you know, and he'll look after you. What the object of my friend's manoeuvres was, I could not conceive, unless it were to keep the lady away from Phelps, who, rejoiced by his returning health and by the prospect of action, lunched with us in the dining-room. Holmes had a still more startling surprise for us, however, for after accompanying us down to the station and seeing us into our carriage— he calmly announced that he had no intention of leaving Woking. "'Your absence, Mr. Phelps, will in some ways rather assist me. Mr. Phelps can have the spare bedroom tonight, and I shall be with you in time for breakfast, for there is a train which will take me into Waterloo at eight. "'But how about our investigation in London?' asked Phelps ruefully. "'You might tell them at Briarbrae that I hope to be back tomorrow night,' cried Phelps, as we began to move from the platform. 
I hardly expect to go back to Briarbrae, answered Holmes, and waved to us cheerily as we shot out from the station. What is your own idea, then? Upon my word, you may put it down to my weak nerves or not, but I believe there is some deep political intrigue going on around me, and that for some reason that passes my understanding, my life is aimed at by the conspirators. It sounds high-flown and absurd, but consider the facts. Why should a thief try to break in at a bedroom window, where there could be no hope of any plunder? And why should he come with a long knife in his hand? You are sure it was not a housebreaker's jemmy? Oh, no, it was a knife. Well, if Holmes takes the same view, that would account for his action, would it not? Presuming that your theory is correct, if he can lay his hands upon the man who threatened you last night, he will have gone a long way towards finding who took the naval treaty. It is absurd to suppose that you have two enemies, one of whom robs you while the other threatens your life. But Mr. Holmes said that he was not going to Briarbrae. I have known him for some time, said I. But I never knew him do anything yet without a very good reason. And with that, our conversation drifted off into other topics. Phelps was still weak after his long illness, and his misfortunes made him querulous and nervous. He would always come back to his lost treaty, wondering, guessing, speculating as to what Holmes was doing, what steps Lord Holdhurst was taking, what news we should have in the morning. "'You have implicit faith in Holmes?' he asked. Why had Holmes remained at Woking? Why had he asked Miss Harrison to stay in the sick room all day? Why had he been so careful not to inform the people at Briarbrae that he intended to remain near them? I cudgelled my brains until I fell asleep, in the endeavour to find some explanation which could cover all these facts. His first question was whether Holmes had arrived yet. He looks like a beaten man, cried Phelps. After all, said I, the clue of the matter lies probably here in town. Phelps gave a groan. I don't know how it is, said he, but I had hoped for so much from his return. But surely his hand was not tied up like that yesterday. What can be the matter? You are not wounded, Holmes, I asked, as my friend entered the room. This case of yours, Mr. Phelps, is certainly one of the darkest which I have ever investigated. I feared that you would find it beyond you. It has been a most remarkable experience. That bandage tells of adventures, said I. Won't you tell us what has happened? After breakfast, my dear Watson, remember that I have breathed thirty miles of Surrey air this morning. I suppose there has been no answer to my cabman advertisement. Well, well, we cannot expect to score every time. The table was all laid, and just as I was about to ring, Mrs. Hudson entered with the tea and coffee. A few minutes later she brought in the covers, and we all drew up to the table. Holmes ravenous, I curious, and Phelps in the gloomiest state of depression. Mrs. Hudson has risen to the occasion, said Holmes, uncovering a dish of curried chicken. Her cuisine is a little limited, but she has as good an idea of breakfast as a Scotchwoman. What have you there, Watson? Ham and eggs, I answered. Good. What are you going to take, Mr. Phelps? Curried fowl or eggs, or will you help yourself? Thank you, I can eat nothing, said Phelps. Oh, come, try the dish before you. Thank you, I would really rather not. Well, then, said Holmes with a mischievous twinkle, I suppose that you have no objection to helping me. Phelps raised the cover, and as he did so he uttered a scream, and sat there staring with a face as white as the plate upon which he looked. There, there, said Holmes soothingly, patting him upon the shoulder. It was too bad to spring it on you like this, but Watson here will tell you that I never can resist a touch of the dramatic. 
Phelps seized his hand and kissed it. "'You have saved my honour. "'Well, my own was at stake, you know,' said Holmes. "'I assure you it is just as hateful to me to fail in a case "'as it can be to you to blunder over a commission.' Phelps thrust away the precious document into the innermost pocket of his coat. I have not the heart to interrupt your breakfast any further, and yet I am dying to know how you got it, and where it was. Sherlock Holmes swallowed a cup of coffee and turned his attention to the ham and eggs. After leaving you at the station, I went for a charming walk through some admirable Surrey scenery to a pretty little village called Ripley where I had my tea at an inn, and took the precaution of filling my flask and putting a paper of sandwiches in my pocket. There I remained until evening, when I set off for Woking again, and found myself in the high road outside Briar Bray just after sunset. Well, I waited until the road was clear. It is never a very frequented one at any time, I fancy, and then I clambered over the fence into the grounds. "'Surely the gate was open,' ejaculated Phelps. "'I heard her shut the door and felt quite sure that she had turned the key in the lock. "'The key?' ejaculated Phillips. "'Yes, I had given Miss Harrison instructions to lock the door on the outside "'and take the key with her when she went to bed. "'She carried out every one of my injunctions to the letter. "'And certainly, without her cooperation. You would not have that paper in your coat pocket. She departed then, the lights went out, and I was left squatting in the rhododendron bush. The night was fine, but still it was a very weary vigil. Of course, it has the sort of excitement about it that the sportsman feels when he lies beside the watercourse and waits for the big game. It was very long, though. Almost as long, Watson— as when you and I waited in that deadly room when we looked into the little problem of the speckled band. There was a church clock down at Woking which struck the quarters, and I thought more than once that it had stopped. At last, however, about two in the morning, I suddenly heard the gentle sound of a bolt being pushed back, and the creaking of a key. A moment later, the servant's door was opened, and Mr. Joseph Harrison stepped out into the moonlight. He was bareheaded, but he had a black cloak thrown over his shoulder so that he could conceal his face in an instant if there were any alarm. He walked on tiptoe under the shadow of the wall, and when he reached the window he worked a long bladed knife through the sash and pushed back the catch. Then he flung open the window and— Putting his knife through the crack in the shutters, he thrust the bar up and swung them open. He flew at me with his knife, and I had to grass him twice and got a cut over the knuckles, before I had the upper hand of him. He looked murder out of the only eye he could see with when we had finished. But he listened to reason and gave up the papers. Having got them, I let my man go— but I wired full particulars to Forbes this morning. If he is quick enough to catch his bird, well and good. As I shrewdly suspect he finds the nest empty before he gets there, why, all the better for the government. I fancy that Lord Holdhurst, for one, and Mr. Percy Phelps, for another, would very much rather that the affair never got so far as a police court. Do you tell me that during these long ten weeks of agony the stolen papers were within the very room with me all the time? So it was. And Joseph? Joseph a villain and a thief? Hmm. I'm afraid Joseph's character is a rather deeper and more dangerous one than one might judge from his appearance. From what I have heard from him this morning, I gather that he has lost heavily in dabbling with stocks— and that he is ready to do anything on earth to better his fortunes. Being an absolutely selfish man, when a chance presented itself, he did not allow either his sister's happiness or your reputation to hold his hand. Percy Phelps sank back in his chair. 
he, without a moment's warning, was bundled out of his room, and from that time onwards there were always at least two of you there to prevent him from regaining his treasure. The situation to him must have been a maddening one. He tried to steal in, but was baffled by your wakefulness. You may remember that you did not take your usual draught that night. I remember. I fancy that he had taken steps to make that draught efficacious, and that he quite relied upon your being unconscious. Of course, I understood that he would repeat the attempt whenever it could be done with safety. I already knew that the papers were probably in the room, but I had no desire to rip up all the planking and skirting in search of them. I let him take them, therefore, from the hiding place, and so saved myself an infinity of trouble. Is there any other point which I can make clear? Why did he try the window on the first occasion? I asked, when he might have entered by the door. In reaching the door, he would have to pass seven bedrooms. On the other hand, he could get out onto the lawn with ease. Anything else? You do not think, asked Phelps, that he had any murderous intention. The knife was only meant as a tool. It may be so, answered Holmes, shrugging his shoulders. I can only say for certain that Mr. Joseph Harrison is a gentleman to whose mercy I should be extremely unwilling to trust. Thank you for watching this video. Please like, share and subscribe to the channel to see the latest videos. Thank you.